Okay. Well, I guess um, we're uh, ready to start. Um, if you haven't noticed, this is the principles of MRI. One of the best classes you will ever take in your life. Just because it teaches about the principles of MRI, which is just incredible. And I cannot think of anything more interesting than that, to be honest. So, you know, good choice. You have probably, uh, you're probably uh, some of the students with the best taste in the department. So, good job. Just go like this and, you know, just like, you know, give yourself a little bit of a kind of a nice punch in the shoulder. It's like, oh, you're, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, we're um, now still in uh, chapter two, going over some of the prerequisites of, uh, of the class. Um, I was able to catch up a little bit yesterday. So um, thank God, otherwise we'll just spend uh, the whole semester just on these prerequisites. Um, any, um, any questions, comments really regarding anything? The class, the homework, the... when is the homework due? I can... Uh, on Tuesday midnight. Okay, Tuesday midnight. Um, hopefully everybody has started. Please, please start. It's going to take you a little bit. I promise you. <laughs> yeah, please start. Okay. Yeah, there's going to be, uh, I think, uh, nine homeworks in the during the semester. Nine. I think that's uh, that's kind of our plan. Okay, um, so we were talking about the sampling theory, um, and uh, just uh, just to recap, uh, we're talking about the case where you want to sample some signal, and the question is like how densely you want to sample. So if I have some sinusoid, if I sample it very finely, that kind of looks right. You know, this is this is good stuff. Uh, and then if I sample it not as often. Maybe I'm going to miss some information that is crucial. For example, if I uh, sample only at those positions, keep on going, I would just get a constant signal. So obviously, it's not a sinusoid. So um, I would have a hard time reconstructing the sinusoid from these measurements. All right, so that's too slow of, a, of an interval. And then uh, we were talking about, OK, what is the critical sampling, where the critical sampling is defined by the Nyquist theorem. And that's pretty much you want more than two samples per period, just slightly more, just uh, just infinitesimally more than two samples per period would allow you to then recover um, um, a signal up to uh, up to that balance. So, in general, you want the rate to be uh, twice as uh, twice as the bandwidth of the signal. Okay, so that that's uh, um, that's the rate of the sampling. Um, okay, so I showed you this. And now um, one thing that maybe it's, uh, you know, it, it, like it doesn't take too much to un understand this, but it takes a little bit more to kind of let us settle. So there, there is some, while the image domain and the frequency domain, the, the rep um, reciprocal domains, um, but often, you know, people are having a little bit of a hard time um, understanding uh, the concept of sampling in the frequency domain. And there's, there's a few reasons for it. First of all, if I sample an image, then often an image would be finite, right? Like uh, when, I, when, I take, when I scan a document, right? That document doesn't cover like infinite space. Like it's okay for me to sample, um, you know, just a small piece of that uh, of that page, and then of course there's a certain rate, like there's a DPI, uh, like dots per inch, that I need to sample it in order to me be able to kind of see all the fine structure uh, inside that that image in order to reconstruct. And if I don't, then I might get artifacts like Murray or a certain aliasing that kind of would look weird. Like you'd, you know, you, instead of seeing kind of like a, maybe an edge that looks like this, you would see an edge that kind of looks like that or, 
you know, all sorts of uh, effect because of the, um, of the discrete sampling. But now I want to talk about sampling in the frequency domain. And that is slightly, diff you know, slightly different. So first of all, um, in the frequency domain, the question is, is the frequency domain finite in general? I mean, obviously there's, um, like, first of all, if you have anything finite in the, in the image domain, obviously it has to be infinite in the frequency domain just by, by itself. But just by, um, you know, if you have something that's finite in one domain, it's infinite in the other domain. So if the image is finite, then obviously the frequency domain is not finite. Um, also the content of the frequency domain, you know, it depends of course on, you know, how, ma how many features they are and like, what is the resolution of the structures? And I mean, like there is, there's a lot of fine structures and images, right? So it's really not, it's really not finite. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an issue. So when sampling an MRI, so we're talking about the frequency F of K, which is, you know, we're sampling in the frequency domain. We're sampling in the, MRI is just an amazing machine. Think about it. It's like, a, it's a Fourier transform machine. It takes your brain or you take some organ in your body, computes a Fourier transform in physics for you, you sample it, and then you need to recover the image by taking an inverse Fourier transform. So it's, this is a natural Fourier transform machine. So we sample in this domain, uh, but there are limitations of where we're gonna sample. So there's two implications. One is if we sample in the frequency domain, we're not gonna cover the entire frequency domain. It's impossible, it's infinite. So we're gonna pick a finite set of the frequency domain, and that's often surrounding you know, the low frequencies somehow, right? So it's some, some band uh, around the low frequencies. So that is uh, what's called a finite support. So that is problem two. Problem one is, you know, how fine I need to actually sample the area that I'm gonna collect. So there's two issues. One is how fine, that's problem one. And then the other one is that I don't collect the high frequencies. These issues would result in certain image artifacts. And so that's what I wanna cover um, uh, here. And we're gonna kind of derive quickly of what will be the result, okay? So it requires you to think a little bit differently for those who are familiar with, with just sampling, just slightly different. Okay, so sampling in the frequency domain. So um, let's, uh, let's recall, um, yeah, let's recall, first of all, uh, one thing. If I uh, take my, uh, if I have some function, f of k, and I multiply it by a delta by a shifted impulse function, that gives me an impulse with a scaling that corresponds to the value of the function at k zero. Okay, so multiplying by a discrete, uh, not discrete delta, but a, an impulse function that's shifted by k0 would evaluate the function f at k0. And that would of course still be an impulse, okay? So I would argue this is kind of like a single sample at um, uh, of the function f at k0, All right? So we're gonna model the operation of sampling through an impulse string. So now I'm gonna take an impulse string. So these are an infinite set of impulses. So we're gonna ignore the fact that we have finite support. We're just gonna sample the entire frequency domain somehow at a spacing of delta K. So these impulse, impulses are separated by delta K and there is an infinite of them and we're gonna multiply our function. Okay. Um, and the way it's gonna look like, it's gonna look something like this, right? We have some function that is the function. Uh, we multiply with the impulse strain. So that's the green arrows. The green arrows are an impulse strain with amplitude one. And the result would be then um, uh, an impulse strain that is scaled by the function f. Okay, so the result would be the red arrows, which are the impulse strain uh, separated uh, 
by, de uh, by delta k, and they're basically uh, the, the length of each one of those impulse functions is exactly the value of the function at that point. So this is very similar to a sampling operation, except that this signal is continuous, but it's impulsive. Okay, so the delta function is, is continuous. We're just trying to represent a discrete like signal, uh, but it, as a continuous function, because it's easier to do the analysis. Does that make sense? Any questions? It's a very typical way of handling sampling. That's, uh, for example, is, this is how we teach this in 123, for example, through uh, multiplying by an impulse strain. Okay. All right, so the result is pretty much Sha function of k over delta k multiplied by f of k, and that would give me these, uh, these impulses. All right. So um, if you remember, um, hold on, uh, if you remember, the uh, this Sha function here is pretty much impulses separated by delta k's, right? So when I scale, uh, I, I'm gonna I'm scaling the function such that it would uh, it would stretch to have a, a, a spacing of delta k. So if you recall, if I have um, a function which is scaled, if I take the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, you would be multiplying by the absolute value of A, and then the scaling is going to be reciprocal. So if this is stretched, this is compressed. If this is compressed, this is stretched. Okay, so this, uh, there's, there's um, I guess, the property of the Fourier transform. So taking an inverse Fourier transform of a scale function would scale it that way. That means that the Sha function, the Fourier transform of the Sha function that is scaled by delta K would be Sha of delta k times x, okay? How does this function look like? How does it look like? It's a sequence of deltas, but now spaced by one over delta k. That's right. It is sequence of deltas, but now spaced by one over delta k as opposed to uh, by delta k as before. Absolutely. So if I take an inverse Fourier transform of this, I will get a sequence of impulses that scale by one over delta k, and the amplitude is also one over delta k. Okay. Because uh, now we don't have this uh, coefficient in front of it. Okay. Now, the other thing that you want to recall is that if I have two functions that are multiplied together, if I take the inverse Fourier transform of that, I would get the uh, convolution between the inverse Fourier transform of this function, which is f of, small f of x, convolved with the inverse Fourier transform of g of k, which is a small g of x. Okay, so multiplication in the frequency domain corresponds to a convolution in the signal uh, or the signal domain or image domain or time domain, okay? So uh, we have two things. One is that the Sha function ends up being with spacing uh, space one over delta K. And then the, the fact that I have multiplication between these two functions, then I'll get a convolution. So what is then the result uh, of this sample sequence? So the sample sequence which I'm going to um, note as f hat of k, this is the uh, sampled sequence, uh, is f of k multiplied by this impulse strain separated each one of them by delta k, right? So in the frequency domain, I've got multiplication between two functions. Hence, if I take the inverse Fourier transform this to see what is the effect in the, uh, in the signal domain or the, uh, in the image domain, then uh, I would get that small f hat would be the inverse Fourier transform of capital F hat of k, which would be then the convolution of the uh, original image, whatever image that we sampled in the frequency domain, but convolved by a impulse strain separated by one over delta k. So effectively, the fact that we sampled in the frequency domain makes our time signal or our image periodic. 
because convolving in the impulse drain means that around every single impulse, I'm going to get an image surrounding this, right? Because the convolution of an impulse with a signal results with a signal. If, this, if, the, uh, if the impulse is shifted, then the signal would be shifted as well, right? So what I would get is a periodic, uh, the image becomes periodic. So f of x multiplied by delta x minus x zero would be a shifted image. And here I will have many, many, many shifted images. And they're going to be shifted by one over delta k. All right. So if, so now here's the, here's the, the real deal here. If f of x, which is the original image, is space limited. What do you mean by space limited? It's limited in space. Uh, it lives only uh, in a certain field of view of space, like it's not everywhere. Is this a good assumption for MRI? Is the image space limited? What do you think? Is that an approximation or it's actually True. It depends on which area you are trying to image. All right. Is it? Uh, is it? I guess, like if you are imaging your head, then the field of view is limited there. So you could say that this is space limited. Okay, the field of view in the head is limited, but what about the rest of the body? Is it limited? I mean, is the scanner covers the entire universe? No. no. The scanner is not covering the entire universe. So obviously it's finite. Now the question is like how much? So obviously the scanner has, I don't know, our scanner has a 70 centimeter bore and really the field is uniform across 40 centimeter, you know, like a circular field of view of 40 centimeter, that's it. So, I mean, that's pretty much, the coverage. So anything outside of that would not be able to image anyway. So absolutely, the image is absolutely space limited because our bodies are finite in space. So that's nice. Okay, so it's not if f of x is actually f of x is space limited and it has a certain field of view in centimeters, right? So that means that the sampled version so if I sample in the frequency domain, the resulting effect in the, in the image domain, so small f hat of x, would be then the convolution between the original object, whatever that image is, convolved with this impulse strain that is separated by one over delta k. So if one over delta k is bigger than the field of view in centimeters, then I would get the replication of my image around each one of those, uh, you know, I get replication, but those replications don't overlap with each other. Okay, so I would have, this is the impulse strain around each one of those, uh, of these impulses, I'm gonna get the image, uh, which I, the image here in this case is just a circle. And therefore I would uh, be able to see those replicas and those replicas are not gonna overlap and therefore that is probably sufficient amount of sampling in the frequency domain because I would be able to see each one of these replicas separately and hence be able to recover that image. Does that make sense? Now, what if I don't sample very finely in the frequency domain, but I sample more sparsely? That means that delta K is bigger. So one over delta K is smaller. If one over delta k is smaller and it ends up being smaller than the field of view, then I would get this situation where I, each of these replicas are now might overlap a little bit with each other. Right? So what I need to do is I need to sample in the frequency domain at a rate which is bigger sorry, uh, smaller than one over the field of view. That's pretty much the, um, um, what it says here, right? So one over delta K needs to be smaller than the field of view 
or the field of view needs to be bigger than one over delta k. Okay. Um, so in that case, if I violate the Nyquist criteria and I don't sample fine enough, then what you'll see is that the edges of the image are going to overlap with the other side. Now, is it something that could happen in MRI? What do you think? Raise your hand if that happened to you. Where's Rebecca? Yeah, Rebecca, right, it happened to you? I got this text from Kuh. Yeah, One I time. did. Like, oh, I, what is that? I still don't understand fully what happened, but hopefully after this class, I'll understand better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what happens is that if you set the field, like the sampling rate to be too big, then you've got these overlaps. And then this is an example of an image that you would be able to reconstruct. And you can kind of see that the uh, nose overlaps with the back of the head. And then the back of her overhead overlaps with the nose, and it can get all these replicas. Now, when you reconstruct, you're obviously just going to get the middle one, right? But like we're always assuming, if we sample in the frequency domain, we're always assuming periodicity of the image, right? So it kind of looks like this. This is the really the image that you'd be uh, reconstructing, and that's what's going to show on the scanner. Um, and so that that can be a bummer if you want to see something here, right? That could be a bummer. Um, so that's that's uh, that could be an issue. So obviously there is a certain limit to how fast, uh, how you know what is the sampling that we need to apply, and that really is determined by the field of view. If you have a bigger object, that means that you need to sample more finely in the frequency domain. If you have a smaller object, then you could uh, make your spacing uh, bigger. And in fact, when you uh, go on the scanner you have to actually have to prescribe a certain field of view. And if you prescribe the wrong field of view, like Rebecca did uh, the other day, then you would get aliasing um, uh, of, of the image um, and uh, you'd get this, this type of effect, okay? So it happens very, uh, very often and can happen in weird situation even. I mean, I, I'll show you some other time. I actually don't have the image with me, but here's the case where, uh, we had a pediatric patient. Uh, we had a pediatric patient lying in the scanner. And that pediatric patient actually had a tube uh, of uh, infusion connected to their arm because they were, uh, were actually under uh, sedation. So there was, uh, let's draw the tube here. So normally, uh, if you have a good technician, the technician will take the tube, will put it really close to the body, uh, and then connect it to, uh, you know, to the subject. But in this particular case, uh, the technician actually uh, put the tube over here. When, uh, the, when they prescribe actually the exam, they prescribe the exam with a field of view covering this area. So the sampling, the sampling was such that you'd be able to reconstruct um, this particular, uh, let's do it in green, this field of view. But the tube has fluid in it. And it was outside of the supported field of view. So there was no, uh, it, it wasn't sampled enough. And so this tube actually aliased and shows up in the middle of the patient as if that patient has an extra um, blood vessel or something inside their body. But obviously it was the tube, right? So the fact that you put something outside of the field of view, you actually make the subject bigger and so then you need to uh, sample more in order to avoid aliasing so that could be an issue and that can happen very very often okay uh, my drawing is not that beautiful so i apologize but does that make sense this is another situation that things can happen. oh, oh, oh actually another situation can happen uh let me uh let me just uh, erase this somehow 
Not sure how. There you go. Here, here's another situation that happens. Um, yeah, uh, a patient lies in the scanner, right? And then they could either put their hands up here or I'll do the uh, Leonardo da Vinci thing, can put their hands over here. Which one is more preferential, preferential if you want to image the abdomen? It depends on the size of your field of view and the bore probably, but you would want them out if you need to be looking at a narrower area. Yeah, so is, is it Lee or Leah? Uh, it's Leah. Leah, thank you very much. First of all, I really like the first comment that you said. It depends because it's true. It really depends. Uh, but in certain situation, uh, it would be more advantageous to put the hands up because the field of view then of the abdomen would be smaller. But in some cases, it wouldn't make a difference. And you're absolutely right. And uh, we'll talk more about that because there's what, some directions where we have to care about the sampling and some direction where we don't have to care about the sampling. And we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Thank you for that. If you're studying like a whole cohort of people, do you have to prescribe this for each subject individually or do you set one value for the whole cohort? So good technicians will set uh, separately, like they, they'll optimize for, for each subject. Um, sometimes uh, uh, though, um, you know, in order to speed things up, uh, some prescriptions are just set to the maximum. So it's not, it's probably not ideal for like smaller subjects, uh, but it, it would be sufficient for larger subjects. So uh, again, the answer is, it depends. <laughs> yeah, but it really depends on the technician, right? Like good technicians will do that. Uh, at the same time, though, if you if you're collect, it, it also depends on what type of data do you need. So if you need to collect data, oh, just, excuse me, just, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Hold on, there's a lot of pain involved right now. All right, I'm good. All right, so um. Um, yeah, I'm back. Um, if you're, uh, okay, I'm almost back. <sighs> All right, now I'm back. Um, it really depends what type of uh, data that you need. For example, if you have some study that is important to have a certain level of noise that is consistent across subjects or, you know, certain things that you want to keep consistent, then uh, sometimes they'll, they'll keep them, right? So, um, but ideally, you, you want to adjust to every patient. Okay. So, a uh, broad question, but um, what's yeah. like the typical kind of like, I guess, wiggle room or like realistic criteria for sampling? Because I imagine you wouldn't want to be at like the bare minimum Nyquist, right? Just in case. It gets cut off. No, actually. Or can well, you? Well, no, no, no. It's like you can see exactly. I mean, like you do. What you do is you do scout scans, and then uh, and then you prescribe on the um, um, like graphically. You can have a graphical scan, like a prescription, where you say, "I'm going to put that size of a window," and you can kind of see how it overlaps with the anatomy. Oh. And you can really prescribe it up to the millimeter if you want to. And sometimes, if there is a really good technician, it would let the uh, it would let the nose, for example, overlap with the bone of the back of the head, right? Or like with the back of the neck where you have the curvature, you know, that still allows you to then like, you could reduce the scan time by 10%, you know, uh, for somebody that has a big nose. <laughs> cool. Right, that's, uh, so, uh, yeah, and the beauty about it is really that, I mean, like images or like body are, is really, you know, it's really finite. So 
um, it, you can be exactly on an aqua square theorem. Um, and it's very common to do so. Okay, so uh, we talked about the discrete sampling and discrete sampling can, leads to replication and then also perhaps aliasing. And I call it aliasing, but it's really, um, it's really, um, yeah, it's like, it's pretty much repl replication of the image on itself. So it's slightly, I mean, we call it aliasing, but um, people that do signal processing would call it something else, I guess. Um, now, finite support is the other thing. Okay, so let's talk about this finite support. And the finite support is that we collect data somewhere in the in the frequency domain, so around zero. This is zero frequency, and then we collect somewhere something here, and we collect over here. But here we just don't know what the object value is. Like we just don't know, right? We collect zero, right? So if you think about it, we can model this by taking our object in the frequency domain and multiplying it by. Rect function? A rect function, yes. So it's a truncation operation in the frequency domain. Absolutely. So this is what actually happens. Um, so we're going to model this finite support, and we call it f sub w. w. Sub w means windowed of k, would be capital F of k multiplied by a, um, by a uh, rect function that it is scaled by the width of k space that we're going to collect, which is w uh, sub k. Okay, the width in the frequency domain, this width is w sub k, and so we're going to scale the rect by w sub k. All right, similarly, um, in the image domain, small f sub w of x would be then the image convolved, because here is a multiplication, convolved with what? Well, it's convolved with the inverse Fourier transform of this rect function, scaled rect function. What is the inverse Fourier transform of a, of a, um, of a scaled rect function? It's a scaled, stretched, or more compact sync function, right? That's, that's pretty much what it is, right? So um, what it would get is I would get the convolution of the image with a sync function. Okay. Now, if you look at a, this beautiful, beautiful function, I mean, look at this. I mean, isn't it gorgeous? Look at it. First of all, a sync function has several properties. It has this wiggly, wiggly, wiggly things, and it has the main lobe, and the main lobe has a certain width, and the wiggly things have a certain height. Okay. So when you convolve some image with this, the main lobe, how wide the main lobe is, is going to contribute to blur. Okay, the fact that you convolve with something that is has certain width, then that would cause blurring of the image. And then the fact that there is this side lobes, that would cause ringing. Okay, that would cause ringing. So there's going to be two effects. Um, one is blurring, and one of them is ringing. Now, if you look at the full width of half max of this, uh, full width of half max is like the width at half the maximum uh, is correspond is proportional to one over uh, w sub k. So the width of the blur is going to determine by how wide you're going to collect in k space. If you're going to collect a wide range in k space, then one over w sub k is going to be very narrow, right? If you're going to collect a very a small piece of k-space, you're going to get a very wide uh, main lobe. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. So the more frequencies I collect, then that means that I'm going to get less blurring. All right. So if this is f of x, right, the same way, and this is uh, the effect of finite sampling, we're going to convolve these two together. And the result would be some blurring of these features as well as ripple. Okay, so both ringing and blurring, these are the two effects. Okay, of finite sampling in the frequency domain. Okay, here's a, here's a quiz. Do you want to do it? Do you want to do the quiz? 
Yeah, you want to do it together? We'll do it one by like uh, one at a time. So uh, the idea here is to rank the strength of the artifacts due to case space truncation. These are the images. F of X, F of small X are the images. We, uh, you have to think of what F of K is and then what happens after we truncate capital F of K, what would happen to the image, uh, you know, how the artifacts are going to be um, for F sub W of X. Okay, well, let's just do one. Let's just do the first one. What is the Fourier transform of F of X? A rect function. It's a rect function. So I'm going to draw a rec function. Now I'm going to truncate the rec function. Does it do anything when I truncate it? It depends. Where well, it depend you truncate it. Right. It depends what I truncate. Yeah, but uh, let's say I truncate it like this, you know, wide enough. Then what will be f w of x? F of x. It's going to be exactly the same, right? So yeah, that's not, it's beautiful. So if I have an object, which is a sink, if I'm actually putting a sink inside an MRI scanner, then, uh, you know, uh, it's going to have a finite case space, which is cool, but like, it's not going to have a fine, but, but if you notice that it doesn't have a finite object support, right? So that, that, you know, that's why we can never put a sink. Even if you tattoo a sink on your arm and you want to scan that, I mean, you can't really tattoo a whole sync function. You have to tattoo a windowed sync, so it's going to be finite. Okay, so yeah, so we're going to be the same. All right, let's, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Let's let's pick this one. What is this? What's the Fourier transform of these two impulses? Cosine. I think. Who said cosine? I did. Who said? Mark, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mark, it's a cosine. It is a cosine. That goes forever, right? In the frequency domain. So what happens when I truncate it? It's going to be a convolution between these two impulse functions and the sync function, right? You should get two sinks on the impulses. Yeah, so I'm gonna have like a, a, yeah, and then another sink, right? So they're gonna be wider and like lots of artifacts. So definitely a lot of artifacts from this thing, okay? What about this? Actually, let's do this one. What's the Fourier transform of erect? Not Mark. A sink. A sink. That's right. And I'm going to truncate it. So it's going to be a windowed sink. What's the inverse where I transform the windowed sink? Like a weird wiggly rect. It's a rect with Gibbs ringing. And the Gibbs ringing and all this width that the rect now has uh, are due to the convolution with the uh, with the sink. And the last one is a triangle, right? So, what is the Fourier transform of a triangle? A sink squared. Nice, douze points. You know what douze points means? You know what this point means? Nobody speaks French? 12 points. It's 12 points. This point. And, uh, you know, for those that are Europeans or Israel, there is this song contest, the Eurovision, the Eurovision song contest every year. This is a contest in Europe where, you know, uh, Bands from, uh, you know, or singer uh, or performers from different countries, they'll go and like do a competition. And it's a big thing in, uh, in Europe. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a national thing. 
and um, the the one that gets the most points, you know, that you can get for uh, from some some uh, you know from something is twelve points. And because it's a European Union, then they have to also speak it in French, and they always say twelve points, du uh, points, you know, something like that. So twelve points. You're not only learning MRI, but you're only learning. You're also learning world culture in this uh, class. Yes. Was there a question? Was there a question? Anybody watch the Eurovision? I do. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Ah, I threw it right. Right, I can. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All my childhood. <laughs> there you go, right? Like it's a big thing, right? Dispont. Yeah. Turkey, Dispont, 12 points. All right. So what is this? So, the, so it's sync square. So that's great. And then uh, what does it mean that square? It means that the tail decays faster. If the tail decays faster, then the truncation artifact shouldn't be as strong. Right, if the tail decays faster. So it's still gonna have some Gibbs ringing, but the Gibbs ringing are not gonna be too bad. Right, so uh, number one artifact. One, two, three, and four. Yeah? Do you think truncation artifacts are a big problem in MRI? Or not a big problem. It depends. Yeah, good. Nice. Good answer. Yes. And actually, sometimes can be a real problem. It could look like anatomy sometimes, like uh, some problems. So, OK, so let's do both. Now, discrete and finite sampling all together. So together. F sub W of hat of K would be F of K, the original uh, K space, and then sampled and truncated. So it's effectively a convolution with, uh, basically it's a convolution with the impulse train as well as a convolution with the sink. One creates replication, the other one blur and ripple. And so this would be then the result. Okay, so you have got blur, ripple, uh, and replication. All right. So actually, some of the ripple over here may leak to the other side, even though the object is finite. So that's, you know, uh, you have to understand that. Okay. Very cool. Now, so this was an analysis in the continuum, right? But if you think about it, uh, we, you know, we sample the frequency domain and this was F sub W uh, hat of X, but images are also discrete in pixels. So in fact, we also sample this, right? We also sample the image domain. So this is kind of how it looks like. And so effectively, by sampling in the frequency domain, we also assume, uh, sorry, in the, by sampling the image, we also then assume that the frequency domain is periodic. So every, every domain that you sample, then the other domain becomes periodic. But the fact that you were, were uh, assuming that the image is represented by discrete samples, and we are represented because we display it on a computer, um, then uh, that also makes the frequency domain periodic. Um, and in fact, that allows us to leverage um, a new operation. So not need to compute a continuous Fourier transform, but in fact, treat this as FW of M, which is an integer, and then use the discrete Fourier transform to get F uh, sub W of N, which is the image. And in fact, in MRI, we don't never really compute a continuous time Fourier transform. We always use the DFT in order to do that. And you have to understand that when you use the DFT, you assume that the Fourier transform is actually periodic. And you also assume that the image is periodic just by definition, even though it is not. 
all right? So there is some assumptions that are made. The fact that we um, crop the image and then use a DFT, you know, there is an inherent assumption that, you know, the frequency domain is periodic as well as the image domain. Although we, we, when we display it, we only display one period of it, all right? Okay, so here's the definition of the DFT. And the DFT is now, doesn't have units. We lost the units once we sampled. It's just indices. So we have the function f of n, and we have the function f of, uh, capital F of m. This is the uh, image domain. This is the frequency domain. And uh, this is the definition, which is not the definition that you, you see in most books. This is a centered DFT. You notice that I use indices that are negative. So n equals minus n over two. So if the size of the image is n, and it starts with minus n over two to n over two minus one. Um, and the reason is because when we look at images, we think of the center of the image as zero or the center of K space as being zero, okay? As opposed to, um, you know, time signals where the beginning is usually zero and there's no negative time, okay? So um, you have to understand that in MRI, we use centered Fourier transforms. And then the inverse Fourier transform is one over N, uh, again, with, uh, with, those, with those ranges. Here, the kernel is minus uh, I two pi MN over capital N, and here is the plus version. And of course, we can compute uh, these DFTs very fast using the FFT, but there is, but there is a subtlety. If you actually use an implementation of FFT given by some package, they don't use a centered DFT. Their DFT assumes that the image coordinate, this coordinate over here is zero, zero. And then in the Fourier transform, they also assume that this coordinate is zero, zero. Whereas in MRI, we like this coordinate in the image to be zero, zero, and we want this coordinate to be zero, zero. So in order to uh, adapt to it, we have to use an FFT shift operation. So uh, if you want to compute a center DFT, then what you do is you first compute an FFT shift, then FFT, and then FFT shift again. If you want to compute an inverse centered Fourier transform, then you do IFFT shift first, then IFFT, and then again FFT shift. And that corresponds to this formula. Okay, so one of the first things that you do as an MRI scientist is you write a function, FFTC, which implements this. So you don't have to do this FFT shift all the time. That's the first thing that we do that every MRI scientist does either takes from a colleague a function FFTC, downloads a, some interesting package somebody, um, somebody else's wrote or writes its own FFTC because otherwise their images don't gonna look right. Does that make sense? Okay. Now let's talk about spatial harmonics a little bit. So what is a spatial harmonic? I mean, it's easy to think of what is a harmonic is, but what is a spatial harmonic? Well, a spatial harmonic is a signal that changes in space in a periodic way. So here's an example of a spatial harmonic. Um, and the question is really, how can I write this function? Well, this is a two-dimensional function. And you can kind of see that um, this is a range of two in length. And over this range of two in length, you have one cycle of oscillation. So uh, white, let's say, represent one. Black, let's say, represent minus one. So here, I have one cycle. So one cycle per two centimeters, right? So that's half a cycle per centimeter. Does that make sense? And then in this axis, in the x direction, I've got one, two, three cycles, three cycles per two centimeters. Okay, so it's one and a half cycles per centimeter. 
So I can write this as cosine 2 pi 3 over 2x plus uh, y over 2. Right? That would be then, how do I know it's a cosine? Because it's at 0, it's a 1. Like at coordinate 0, it's a 1. If it started at a 0, then it would probably uh, be a sine or something like that. So we'll have a different phase. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so now we can then also define a two-dimensional Fourier transform. And a two-dimensional Fourier transform looks like a one-dimensional Fourier transform, only now you have two coordinates, two coordinates for fre frequencies and coordinates for, uh, for space. So f is a function of x and y, and then capital F is a function of kx and ky. And now in order to compute the Fourier transform, we have a double integral that integrates over the entire space, integrates over x and integrates over y with a two-dimensional spatial harmonic. So two-dimensional, so e to the minus two uh, uh, um, i two pi, kx times x and ky times y. Or often it is written in this particular way, x hat dot uh, k hat, right? It's the same thing. Okay, it's the inner product. Between. So, what is the four uh, the two dimensional Fourier transform of cosine two pi three x plus y? What is it? Should be four dots, I think. Really? Why four dots? It's a cosine. Because there's there are deltas for and so there should be one on each side. And then That's right. So we can decompose that we can we can decompose it into two complex harmonics. And each complex harmonic would represent just one impulse. Right? So it should be two impulses. And the question is where those impulses are going to be. Well, what is the frequency? Well, the frequency is three in the x direction and one in the y direction, right? So um, if this is five at the edge, then three, three is over here in x, and here is gonna be one in y, right? So then I'm gonna have an impulse over here. And then of course I should have an impulse in the other side. And that would be an impulse over here. So three and one, that's going to be an impulse here. So that would be then the Fourier transform. Two impulses, whereas this is uh, one, and this is three, this is three, and this is one. Okay. All right, what if I have separable functions like f, uh, f x, y is f of x multiplied by f of y? Can I Which ask a one question is the two about the previous Absolutely. example? Um, how do yeah. we know that the impulse is at 3, 1 and not at like minus 3, 1 and 3 minus 1? Well, if we had the minus here, then it would have, it would have been at minus 3, right? But that's the, but the frequency that we have is three. It's three times x and it's one times y. So it's three cycles per centimeter in the x direction and then um, and then um, one in y, right? So if you um, if you want to change those coordinates, um, then uh, I think if you, uh, yeah, if you put a minus here, I think that would work out. If what would mistaken. that look like in the image? Uh, it would be this one and this one. What would it uh, look like in terms of the harmonic, the original image? Oh, it would be rotated by, um, 
it would be rotated, right? Like if this if this was uh let's see, yeah. So if this this is uh you know the direction I guess of the wave is here. So the other case would be in this direction, and the image would look like uh you know that way. Does that make sense? Wouldn't there still be three cycles though? in the same number of units? Yes, it will be three cycles. Yeah. But how do we know to have that be negative? Well, uh, you have to look at the, okay, so you have to look at the uh, uh, orientation, I guess. I guess the negative would be in the, in this case, the negative would be in the Y, if I'm not mistaken. Let's see. Um, if I have uh, if I have a wave in this direction, so um, I'll have to yeah. So it would be um, it would be sorry it would be like this yeah. So it would be minus one yeah. So it would be in the y. B basically, th th if this is the direction of the wave, then you know that's the direction of the deltas, and then the original one was in this direction, right? Because then it's you know it it follows this wave, and then these two deltas it's kind of like I mean I I can rotate pretty much the entire axis right. So if you think about that, does that make sense? Um, if I uh, yeah, does that answer the question or? It answers my question. All right, so um, the question is, if we have a separable functions, then uh, what would happen in this case? F of x, y equals F of x multiplied by F, y, which is the 2D uh, Fourier transform? This one or this one, one or two? Right, it's a multiplication in the signal domain. Should be convolution, right? I think two. Um, no. <laughs> when it's a separable function, it's actually the multiplication between the two. And the reason is if I put a double integral over these, uh, because one is a function of x and one is a function of y. I can just separate into two integrals, multiply together. Okay. It would have been a convolution if uh, if uh, this had an x and y, and this was had, had an x and y. But otherwise, it doesn't. Uh, you know, um, it's not a convolution. Okay. So you have separable functions. Then it's a Fourier is a multiplication of those separable functions. Okay. That was a tricky question, but it happens quite a bit. For example, uh, a nice separable, separable function would be um, like a two-dimensional rect, right? The two-dimensional rect is the is the multiplication between a rect in the x direction and a rect in the y direction. And so the 2D4 transform of this would be a sink in the x direction multiplied in a sink in the y direction. Okay, so it's very easy to derive. Okay, so um, in, two, the, in 2D, everything is the same, except a little bit more complicated. You know, F hat of W of KX of KY is, you know, is the, um, you know, is the multiplication between the original function and then a two-dimensional delta train with sampling in, you know, different sampling maybe in delta KX and delta KY, and then a truncation uh, in the frequency domain, but that could be different in X and it could be different in Y. And so in the image domain, you would get a convolution with the two-dimensional two-dimensional impulse strain, and then a convolution with a two-dimensional sink, right? And so you get similar effects, except that in 2D. 
just more degrees of freedom for sampling. And here's just an example. Let's say you've got a, an image which has this field of view. And the question is, what is the delta X and delta Y that you need to sample in order to avoid aliasing? Delta KX and delta KY. Is it one over five and one over 15? Right, so in, in the X direction, it's one over five, right? And then in the Y direction, it's one over uh, it's one over fifteen. So uh, you really need to sample more finely in the Y in the KY direction than you need to sample in the KX direction, because the field of view is a, uh, is not uh, is not uh, square. And it's very often that's how it's done. You know, you you actually uh, sometimes pick the direction based on the thinnest area. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so. The sampling would be uh, something like this, you know, um, much more fine sampling in this axis than in the other axis. Does that make sense? Okay, so now I rotate this object. And it looks like this. So now the question is, what is delta kx and what is delta ky? Same object, just rotated. They should both be one over fifteen. Well, definitely they should be both one of. I mean, that should work, right? Like if I do one over fifteen, then you know the replication would then put me this thing over here and then another replica over here, another replica over here, another replica over here and so on and so forth, right? So they're not gonna overlap. You're absolutely right. But is it actually the only option? If it's 15 tall, you should just be able to get away with like one over root two 15, if it's at 45. Well, I mean, Look at this case, right? In this case, I sample it that way, right? Right? And now it's just rotated. So can't I just rotate my sampling? Right, I could rotate my sampling. So effectively, not sample just regular delta X, but actually sample more fine across the diagonal. and less fine in the other dimension. Crazy, huh? So obviously you can see that there's more degrees of freedom here. And this would be then, you know, if I have that type of scan, I would prescribe actually what's called an oblique scan, where I'm not gonna choose the axes, but I'm actually gonna choose this as the axes, because sometimes it would allow me to reduce my sampling. And in fact, actually, even if I didn't do that, even if I didn't do this type of sampling, if I actually sampled at uh, one over five centimeter in the X direction, and then one over 15, what it would say is that I'm gonna get a replica, which, you know, the second replica is gonna be like here, and gonna be like here, and they're actually not gonna overlap. but I'm going to see the replica inside my square image. It's gonna be annoying, but they're not gonna overlap. It's kind of like the noise wrapping up with the back of the neck, but not, not, uh, you know, not touching it. You know, that could happen, right? Like if I have a, a head and a neck and then a nose over here, and then the nose could appear over here, but it's not overlapping. So it's similar. So uh, the answer actually is also a tricky question is really that you don't need to change the sampling in order for it to avoid aliasing, right? Because the object is really five centimeters wide anyway. Weird, huh? Okay, what about circularly symmetric functions? Uh, sometimes you have a function 
f of x, y that can be represented by a function of the radius. In that case, there is what's called the Henkel transform of the zeroth order that uh, performs the same computation. So the 2D Fourier transform of f of r actually has this form. So it's 2 pi r f r, uh, the Bessel function is zeroth order, 2 pi r uh, rho k dr. So if I have this type of a function, what does this function look like? Is it a circle? Yeah, it's a circle. It's called the circ. It is a circle. And what's the dimensions of the circle? It goes from, you know, it has a diameter of one, right? A radius of half. And it has an amplitude of one. So it's kind of a pillbox. It's like a pillbox. Okay. So the Fourier transform of a pillbox circle is actually J1 uh, pi, you know, whatever this, which if you stare at this long enough, instead of looking at J1, if it was a sign, then it would look like a sink, right? Kind of, but no, uh, this is actually not a sink. And because it has a J1 Bessel function of the first order, we call it the jink. Okay, so the Fourier transform of a pillbox is actually a jink function. Okay, which is also circularly symmetric. So if you have something circularly symmetric in the image domain, it turns out that it's also circularly symmetric in the frequency domain. Here are some Fourier transforms. So here's, uh, here's a, a Fourier transform. And can you see the two dots over here? They're a little bit tiny. But you can, uh, I drew it in two different ways. One is an image and one is a, you know, like a, like a surface. So you can see the two impulses, right? So the Fourier transform of this function is these two impulses. Um, so this is the function, how it looks like in, if you look at the surface. And then if I go to a higher frequency, then these two will be further apart. So here it's low frequency, so they're very close. If it's higher frequency, then they're further apart. And let me just draw, that's where the points are. And before that, they were here. Okay, so they're further apart. So higher frequency, means that these two points are going to be further apart in the frequency domain. Now, if I have a, um, a sink, sink in this direction multiplied by a sink in this direction, it looks like this. And it's for a transform is a two-dimensional rect. And you can kind of see that the sink is more stretched here. And that means that it's going to be more compact in the frequency domain. And here it's more compact, so it's more stretched in the frequency domain. So stretching in one dimension makes it more compact in the other dimension and you know, in the other way. So here's the case where it's really stretched and you can kind of see how more compact in the frequency domain it becomes. Does, do you see the difference? All right, this is like, you know, sink that goes for a long time, very, very narrow. And this is kind of like a stretch, stretched one. And then you can see, this is the result. Now, what's the difference between a sink and a jink? You know, a sink, it's the blue one. And then a jink is the, is the, is the green one. And there's two, two different, uh, two distinctions between them. They kind of look similar. If I just showed you a jink, you say, oh, it's a jink function, but it's not. First of all, the zero crossings are not the same. It's, they're not uh, equispaced for a jink function. And the other thing is that the jink function actually decays faster than a sink function. Okay, so they're slightly different. The one dimensional Fourier transform of a sink is direct. Okay, this is a truncated sink, so yeah, it's erect, but it's like with artifacts. And then the, and here's the cool thing. The one dimensional Fourier transform of a jink is actually half a circle. 
Ja, cool. Yeah. So if I um, if I have a two-dimensional jink, then I would have a, 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 a pillbox. This is a two-dimensional jink function. Look at how gorgeous it is. It's like a drop of water, right? Look. Beautiful, huh? And that corresponds to a, uh, a, a pillbox. And then if I shift, if I shift uh, the jink from its center, then the effect is going to be that it's going to have a linear phase in the frequency domain. So now uh, this is the real and this is the, uh, sorry, this is the magnitude and this is the phase. These are basically two images, one phase and one, uh, and one uh, magnitude. The magnitude is constant, so nothing has changed in the magnitude, but then now there is a linear phase across it because the jink was shifted. And this is the real and imaginary parts overlaid on top of each other. Now, this is a sink of R. So if I take a sink and I make it radially symmetric, what the result is going to look like a circular one, but the edges are emphasized. And uh, that's why kind of the jink, because it's, you know, it's like a, uh, it removes the edges and that becomes like a circular. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, um, if, you, uh, if you do a sink that is, uh, that is circular symmetric, then it's gonna have this really strong edge. Still a beautiful function. Okay, let me just show you some artifacts. Man, I can't get the, I, I, I can't move along in this class. It's like too slow, but uh, you know, I'm just gonna finish this. I'm not gonna, like basically I'm again, one lecture behind. No, no, no matter. Um, one of my former students now, uh, Professor Tamir, who's a faculty at uh, UT Austin, is teaching a similar class at UT. And so uh, he's one lecture ahead, which is a good thing because I find all the bugs and then I fix it for you. So uh, he's been debugging my slides and I'm been deb debugging his. And so some of the exercises that uh, we had in MATLAB, uh, John has converted some of them to Python. So we'll give you the opportunity to choose which one you wanna do, if you wanna do MATLAB or Python, but we have the two options for you. So uh, thank John Tamir for that. All right, so this is an MR image that I collected. And uh, like if, you ver if you're familiar with this, uh, then you'd see that there is something wrong going on with this image. Anybody has an idea what's wrong with this image? Somebody can say, oh, it has the G logo and not Siemens, but that's not, the, that's not what's wrong with it. Is it the ripple and the, all the white areas? Yeah, there's, these, uh, there's this periodic signal that's on top of it, right? Any idea where the source is? This is a, an image I got actually collected. The spike? Nice. That's right. So if you actually compute the two-dimensional Fourier transform of this, and you look at k-space, I don't know, it's very hard to see, but I'm going to emphasize the spike. There's actually a bright pixel over here, a single, a single bright pixel in the frequency domain over here. And that's sometimes caused because, uh, of, you know, sometimes there'll be spikes because gradient switch and they'll create actually a spike and the digital to analog converter, analog to di digital converter would basically saturate and create a white pixel. So um, yeah, so that could happen. And because there is a spike here that correspond to a complex harmonic, that's exactly the amount of ripple that goes here. Now the question is though, what's the Fourier transform of a complex harmonic? There's a lot of subtleties by the way in this image. What's the Fourier transform of a complex harmonic? Uh, sorry, of a spike, of a spike. Oh, sorry, a, a Fourier transform of a shift, like a non-centered spike. 
What is it? It's a complex harmonic, actually. It's a complex harmonic going in this direction. What is the magnitude? This is the magnitude image. What's the magnitude of a complex harmonic? What's the magnitude? One. It's one. So how come I don't see, you know, uh, like, you know, so I mean, it's it's constant. So why am I seeing here the, the ripple? I mean, it should be constant. So I shouldn't be seeing ripple. And like, uh, but it should be everywhere. So how come I see black over here? Weird, huh? Well, the reason is, by the way, is the following. Is if I have a complex harmonic, you know, so I have a real part and I have an imaginary part. And the magnitude of that, if I look at the magnitude, the magnitude would be constant. When I display an image, normally, I mean, I, I set black to be some value and I set white to be some value. So often, you know, even though you have some background, you might set this offset to be black. And this is why this is dark. Now, why is there a ripple here? Well, because if I had a rect and I added to it a complex harmonic, then it would actually it would actually change the value of the rect. It's the magnitude of this plus this would be um, would be something like that. Okay, so there's a lot of subtleties here. So effectively, if you look at the image, the image is actually has a background because of the spike, and it's modulated where there is signal. But this is a very typical spike artifact. Happens a lot in MRI. In so, particular, when you do EP, EPI. So is there like a fairly straightforward way to correct for that sort of spike? Like, can you kind of average pixels um, in, the, in the Fourier space in order to, to totally. eliminate that ripple? Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally you can do it, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's actually how it's done. Uh, sometimes the, the scanners will have spike detectors and then they'll just interpolate. Mm -hmm. If they detect a spike, then uh, you know, they, they actually would remove a lot of them. I mean, it, it's not the perfect, uh, but it definitely corrects this like really bad artifact. Is it true that uh, static electricity can sometimes cause them? And, and what else? Yeah. Any, I mean, um, Anything that arcs, sometimes you have arcing due to various reasons, uh, you know, gradient switch very quickly. They create like huge voltage differences that can spike. Um, sometimes the RF coil, the connector, sometimes connectors uh, can, you know, can like not be great. So they can spike, um, things like that. Sometimes there'll be, uh, you know, electricity spiking and all sorts of stuff. Thank so you. here's, uh, let, let's, yeah. Quick question about the spike. What about correcting it by taking the conjugate symmetric value from the you know from the symmetric place in K space? Wouldn't uh, that work? That could almost that could almost work. Um, but uh, because MR images have phase, then it would be perfect, right? So yeah, I mean, there's many ways to correct, but that's that could be one way. But you have to be careful. I mean, the fact that I you can probably zero it out. It's fine. It's not going to have a lot of even if you zero out, I think it will be fine. Great. It's not going to be as strong, at least. OK, so here's the two-dimensional Fourier transform of this object. And I, you know, it's, it's interesting, because you see a few features here, right? Like you can definitely see this vertical lines. And then I don't know if you, there's a lot of energy over here. And there's these kind of blobs. Anybody has an idea where each one of is coming from, where these are coming from? Is it where the image gets very close to the edge? Well, I mean, this is periodic, right? 
It's a periodic structure. If you have, and it's kind of impulsive a little bit, right? So do, do you see anything that's periodic and impulsive in the same direction in the image? Is that little cone thing on the top left? Right, this is kind of like an impulse train along this direction. Not exactly, but approximately. And so then you got this impulse is also showing up because of that. Exactly in the same direction, which is interesting. And uh, actually you can verify that this is the case by uh, basically erasing them. And if I erase these and uh, look what happens, it flattens that comb. Well, barely touching anything else, barely, but not completely. Interesting, huh? Yeah. So uh, the other thing is like the, this line over here, this line over here comes from the fact that there's a lot of edges that are horizontal. Every edge that is horizontal means that there is a big change. Oh, sorry. Apologize. Uh, this spread over here, that's because of edges in the vertical, like in this direction, because of all these edges. All these edges are very, very strong, and then they create basically high frequencies along this dimension. And so you can kind of see that uh, in this uh, in this whitening of you know on the frequency domain. And if I delete this, like here. You could see how those edges are becoming smooth. Do you see if I delete that? Let's go back and forth. Cool, huh? And if I delete this edge, this uh, this uh, this part. Let's see if I delete it. No, I didn't. Okay, I didn't show it. But uh, now, what happens if I rotate the frequency domain? If I rotate the frequency uh, the image, then I also rotate the frequency domain. So rotation in the image domain is a rotation in the frequency domain. And that kind of makes sense. I mean, I computed something, right? The Fourier transform, and then I, I you know, I, I take the image and I, you know, I take the page and rotate. It's the same as rotating the the frequency domain. So rotation here is a rotation here. Now, what about shifting? Here's a case when I actually, the K space is shifted. It's not centered. And I computed the inverse Fourier transform. Well, if I computed the inverse Fourier transform and I look at the magnitude, well, the magnitude looks fine because shift in the frequency domain means a linear phase multiplication in the time, in the, in the image domain, but the linear phase multiplication has no magnitude change. So it really doesn't affect the magnitude image. So shifts are pretty much uh, make the image robust, like the image is robust to any shift in the frequency domain. If I look at the phase, well, now I can see kind of how there is a phase across the dimension that this was shifted. Okay. Does that make sense? Can I ask another question about Natalie, the a... feature? The what? The Can I ask another feature? question yeah. about the cone? Yeah. So like the fingers on the cone, they're periodic, but they're it's only like at one frequencies. Maybe I'm not thinking about it right, but so then why do we see four dots in case? Well, right. So okay, so this is a comb and it has a certain delta x between this each combs. Yeah. So in the frequency domain, the spacing would be one over delta x, so it would be further apart. Yeah. So I, I might actually, if I collected more of K space, I might have seen, you know, actually another one here, another one here, another one here. Oh, and okay. Keep on going. Now, the other thing, though, is that the comb is actually not a delta, but actually a certain width, right? Yeah. So a certain width, you can actually model this as a convolution with a rect, which is a, in, the, in, in this domain, it will be a multiplication with a sink. So you can kind of see how these slowly decay, like they become, they become smaller and smaller in amplitude because of the width of this comb, of each one of those elements. Okay. 
that makes more sense. So that's why they that's why they don't go too far. At at some point they're just gonna decay. You know? Yeah. So this is can all be derived by Fourier theory. You can actually go and kind of actually figure out what is delta x, and you can figure out, oh, this correspond to that. And you know, why is this so wide? Well, that probably depends on what is the length of this and all sorts of stuff like that. So Uh, but uh, it's very, it's, it's untypical to see a uh, very like clear structure in the Fourier domain that you can find in, you know, a, a structure in the image domain that corresponds to them. And because this is periodic, then it's very easy to see this. Otherwise, it's very hard. All right, I think we're definitely over time and, uh, you know, uh, I've taken too much of your time and I, I really appreciate you sticking out here. Um, that's just pretty much what I have in terms of preliminary material. So that's good. That means that now we're going to move into uh, exploring chapter three in the book. The homework that you have is mostly uh, on uh, you know chapter two, so should we, we should be okay. So on Tuesday we're going to start chapter three. Please read chapter two and three, um, possibly before we go over, so it will be much clearer for you as we go over it. Okay. Um, and uh, I wish you all a very ha uh, happy and enjoyable weekend. And uh, I see you all on the Tuesday. Looking really forward to seeing you all over there. And I'll find some good art to show you before we start. All right. And if you have something, uh, feel free to send me. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank bye, you. Everyone. Have a good weekend. You too.